just thought that was the most awesome thing in the world. I got to travel the world. I got to meet with kings and queens and presidents, monarchs, rock stars, and billionaires. And they know what your title is, if you will? They know my title, and if I'm working, I'm wearing the high wizard costume. This is Touched by Heaven, everyday encounters with God. Those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God. We see his hand reaching out to us, attempting to get our attention, inviting us into a closer relationship. Here we share stories of encounter with angels, divine intervention, prophetic dreams, visions, near-death experiences, big and little God incidents. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. Welcome to episode 125. Glad you're here. Well, let's check the title, That Old Black Magic. You know that song, right? I think Sinatra had the big hit. That Old Black Magic got me in its spell. Round and round I go, down and down I go, in a spin, but loving that spin I'm in, and that old black magic. Well, well, well. It doesn't take much to spiritualize the lyrics. This is bad news. Our guest today is Zach King. Get this. <laughs> On this show, one of the top Satanists in the world for 12 years, a high wizard. Don't let that scare you. Don't make that make you run away. This is a victory again for God. This is Jesus leaving the 99 and going and get, excuse me, Zach, if you're listening, I know you are at some point, one of the worst of the worst. <laughs> now, there is an R-rated version of the story. We're not, we're not doing that story here. We'll keep it to PG, PG-13. But the important aspect is the conversion, that the moment of conversion is so dazzling, it's so good, and it involves Jesus and Mary coming to get Zach. It's, it's incredible, off-the-chart stuff, right? You know, think about the conversion stories you've heard. You've heard St. Paul. Is there a greater conversion story than St. Paul? But St. Paul was a man of God. St. Paul was taught by one of the top Jewish teachers. He knew his Torah. He was about God. He was educated. He just had this job of, you know, persecuting the Christians and, you know, throwing them in jail and killing them if need be. But, but you know, that was just his job. And then, you know, Jesus knocked him off his horse. Okay. A great conversion story. Or I think of uh, St. Augustine in the 300s, into the 400s. Here was, here was a party boy. This is also one of the great conversion stories. St. Augustine is uh, loved and admired by Catholics and many Protestants alike for being this, as being one of the church fathers. He wrote beautifully. He, he, uh, he's educated us to this day. St. Augustine, read upon him if you're not aware. I mean, he's, you know, a great conversion story. And then you have this story of Zachary King. This, this guy was holding the hand of the devil. At age 10, He's already practicing black magic by 13. He's in a coven by 15. He's broken all the commandments by 21. He's a high wizard. He's got it all, right? Satanic rituals. He knows he's going to hell, and he's okay with that because he's been told he'll be one of the one, one of the people running the joint. Yeah, Zach, he's going to run the joint. See, here's what happened. You sell the soul to the devil. See, that's what you do. And then you get to run the joint, huh? And they believe this? Sure, why not? He's got everything. He has access to 50 million bucks, all the homes uh, you could possibly want all over the place. He's got cars, sports cars, any car he wants, he has it. How many women would you like in a day? How, how, much, how many drugs? How, how much booze? How, how much, how much, how much? He had it all and he could have more if he wanted it. That's what, that's what he had. Round and round he's going. Down and down he goes in a spin, but loving it. Loving that spin he was in and that old black magic. I've never heard a conversion story like yours. You are such a hopeless case. I was, I was, I was telling people, I was telling this uh, a few nights back, I was telling some people, I, I was mentioning that I was going to be talking to you, and I said, you, you are this incredible figure that gives us all hope that our kids who aren't where, they, where we wish they were or brothers and sisters or friends or whomever we're worried about and praying for, I said, you got to hear Zach King here because what, it, there's no way this guy comes back from being this high wizard to, to this. There's just no way. Where do you think your story begins? My story starts between like two and 10 years old when I was obsessed with every magic movie or dark movie I could get my hands on. What was playing on Saturday on like the creature feature double feature on TV. You know, like every horror movie, any any movie that was scary or dark, I wanted to see. Movies about Satanism or like Rosemary's Baby or The Exorcist or The Shining. You know, those things were super fascinating to me. Your parents later on in life, 
did they say, yeah, you were acting kind of oddly at such and such an age, and you did seem to be kind of going off into strange lands? At one time, I, I had asked my dad, this is, I was, I was probably in my early 20s, and I asked my dad, I'd been to counseling for a couple of years, and I said, at what age do you remember my life? Like, when did things happen that, you know, where I just wasn't that nice of a person? And I had a number written down on a piece of paper. And both my parents said, I'd say when you were 11. And I turned the piece of paper around and it had the number 11 on it. And they said, okay, so what happened to you at 11 years old? And I said, I was the victim of a sexual assault at school at the hands of a female teacher. But as a result of that, I pretty much went off the rails insane. I mean, I started doing whatever I was going to do, anything I wanted to do. Was there any God in the house at all at that time? Yeah, I was going to the Baptist church in diapers all the way up through till I was about 15. Did it mean anything through 15? Mean anything? Everything was no. And then to me, the Bible was a whole list of things you couldn't do. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. So God's saying no. My parents are saying no. And Satan's saying, here you go. Yeah. Do whatever you want. The Bible says in approximately 33 places not to do magic or magical things. You know, sometimes it's witchcraft, sometimes it's soothsaying or fortune telling, or psychics or sorcery. And I know that you know, every movie I'm watching, it's real. So I thought, I need to do a magic spell in real life. So I did a spell for money. And the next day I went out playing and I found a can of tennis balls with a $5 bill in it. When you say you did a spell, what, what? What does that mean? What did you do? I brought two candles. Well, not into my house. I was doing the spell in a, we had a clubhouse in the, in the woods of pencil and a piece of paper. And I wrote down what my intentions were that I was doing a spell for money. And in one of the movies I had seen, you have to invoke Satan. So, and I saw how they did it in the movie. So, and and you believe that there was a Satan, or you're just yeah, it was Baptist. We, we believe in Satan. <laughs> well, as we know, there are a lot of Christians who don't. So, you know, um, but okay. So you 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 knew you you had to write it down, and the candles played their role, and you invoke Satan. So the next Friday, I went out playing again, went to that spot again, and did my spell again. And the next day, I went out. And when I was walking to a friend's house, I just happened to look down at the ground and saw a $10 bill in the grass. And, you know, I'm thinking $15 in eight days, this is pretty damn cool. But this still could be a coincidence. So at the same time as that's going on, when I started to school, this was in the, the fifth grade, the very first day of class, this kid came up to me and he said, meet me in the bathroom at the first break. We get our first break at 1020. And I went into the bathroom. I have no idea why I'm going in there. Just this kid said so. And so I walked in there and there's like 49 other kids in there. And it is boys and girls in the same bathroom. You know, there's a little murmuring because now, you know, we're all standing in the dark. Nobody can see anything. And they teach us the phrase, and we start saying it. And it's just a Bloody Mary chant. And so we did it, I think, 11 times. And the scary face showed up in the mirror, and 49 kids ran screaming out of the bathroom. But not so, you. Not me. I'm the dumb one in the room. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I said this chant 11 times, and that face showed up. That's the coolest thing in the world. You got a face showing up. So what do you do with that? So I could go in my own bathroom as many times as I wanted, turn out the lights and, you know, chant the phrase. Every time you saw a face. 
every time. Yeah, I'd go eat breakfast, come back in, brush my teeth, do it again. I mean, it was like I was doing it 25 times a day. And when the face shows up, I make sure it knows I'm doing this magic spell for money. I did all my spells on Friday because Saturday was a day of play for me. Saturday, I go out and I'm playing. I found what looked like Monopoly money rolled up tight in rubber bands. So I just stuck that in my pocket and went back to playing. And that night, you know, I'm checking out this treasure that I have. Everybody's gone to bed. And I'm in my room with my sheet up over my head and a flashlight in my mouth. It looked like Monopoly money because I'd never seen a $100 bill. And when I unraveled everything, I had 10 $100 bills. And now I know for certain beyond any reasonable doubt that magic works. And what exactly does a 10 year old kid do with a thousand bucks when it's in hundred dollar bills? <laughs> well, hey mom, the... Hey mom, I found some of this. Would you take this to the bank and I need twenties. It doesn't exactly work. Does it? Well, almost any store that you would buy anything at would break a hundred. The first store I went to was the record store a place called bells. And I bought all the Kiss albums that I could get my hands on at that time. That you would like Kiss. Gee, that's not a stretch, is it? Yeah, no, not really. Um, okay, so where does that leave a kid? What's, what, what do you do with that? I had believed that the, the devil's the bad guy, but the devil's given me what I want. It can't be that bad. My parents and God are telling me no for everything. Well, they can't be that good. I read everything the library had on either witchcraft or on somebody who claimed they had been a witch or a Satanist. Next, for Zachary, came this huge, horrible leap as he got to know the wrong people. And after having this sexual abuse happen with a teacher and just what that did to his, to his mind, he became involved in child pornography. And we'll film it because you'll be famous. You know, and I wasn't sure about all that, especially the filming part. So they showed me movies like that. So they got me involved in child pornography. And you, you were how old about the, uh, at this time? I was 12. You know, I'm not realizing that I'm being re-victimized every weekend. You know, I'm thinking that, you know, this is the coolest experience in the world. So being with this group, I had my first cigarette, my first pill, first joint, first mushroom, first acid tab, first lewd, first speedball, first mixed drink, first beer, first shot. You know, and, and I can do as much of anything as I want, as often as I want. And Satan's supposed to be the bad guy. So, you know, I'm doing all this stuff and this older kid tells me, you know, you're a member of a satanic cult, right? He said, there's 13 steps to becoming a Satanist and you've done almost all of them already. So what I had left to do, I was supposed to have a sleepover one night, but instead of staying at the house, we went out to a farmhouse. And the night before, I had sliced my left thumb, bled onto a document, and signed it in three places in my own blood. The blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not mine. And I signed that. Jesus died for everybody, but not me. And I signed that. And then on the final page of a five page document, I agreed to sell my soul to the devil. And I signed that. Then the next day, you come out in a black robe, signifying you've been baptized into a world of darkness. I sit in a chair and they hand me a wheel with a crucifix in it. You spin the crucifix upside down, which signifies human sacrifice. They read the document that you signed the night before. And then you break the arms downward, denouncing Christ. They take the paper that you signed and bind it together with this wheel and upside down crucifix. 
and they say that your soul is forever tied to this. And then we have a party afterwards, which turns into an orgy. But the truth of that is that you're having a party celebrating that one day you're going to die and go to hell. We had, I think, 12 deacons in my church. And 11 of those deacons were Freemasons. And they were also members of my satanic coven. How fast did you move up in this coven? I learned everybody's techniques and I managed to get the red robe, which made me the official, one of the official magic practitioners for this coven. Um, this coven, by the way, was um, affiliated with the OTO, which is probably the second largest satanic coven in the world. So Zachary King in his teen years is moving up. He wants bigger covens. He, he wants to practice more black magic. He, he wants a coven where it's serious. Let's do some big work, right? And he's doing bigger work and moving up in the chain, and people are starting to realize who he is, and he gets to the age of 21. I walked in there, and they started talking to me that, and telling me that I've been chosen to be the next high wizard. They showed me a wall that had nine different designs of high wizard costumes. So I can either choose one of those or combine looks or choose my own. They told me that we worked hand in hand with the Illuminati. They gave me a high wizard handbook that was very hokey. I opened it up on the very first page. It said, nobody can tell you what to do. I just thought that was the most awesome thing in the world. I got to travel the world. I got to meet with kings and queens and presidents and monarchs, rock stars and billionaires. And they know what your title is, if you will? They know my title, and if I'm working, I'm wearing the high wizard costume. Anybody we would know? Well, if you look on if you look on YouTube, now I didn't work directly with these people, but you know, there's a video of Katy Perry saying that she wanted her parents were evangelists, so she traveled the world with them and she would sing. She wanted to be the next Amy Grant. But since she failed at that, she sold her soul to the devil. She admits that. Bob Dylan was interviewed on 60 Minutes, and he said he sold his soul to the devil. Thankfully, he found all- Christianity later, thankfully. Uh, Is the uh, Lady Gaga story true? You familiar? She said that she was performing in a strip club and she walked out the back door. And this guy identified himself as being a member of the Illuminati and said that if she sold her soul to to the Illuminati, that she would become uh, a hit. And she says it's true. I don't know if that's folklore, oh. if that's true, or if that's something that's part of the image or what, but it, uh, you know. I made, I made about 1,200 rock stars while I was a high wizard. You say you made them? I made them rock stars. Um, what I would do, you would do what's called a warehouse deal. So you'd go to either Hollywood or Los Angeles, and we meet in the warehouse district And these people, they're promoters, agents, uh, producers, friend tells them there's one of these things going on. You say the right thing, you could be famous. So my limo arrives and I start walking through this building. Uh, Sometimes you get full band show up or just a rock star from the band shows up or somebody that's not a rock star but wants to be. And... I walk through the warehouse and I look for either you have a particular look that attracts my attention or a demon is near you that's telling me to approach this person. So then I walk up and I ask, who wants to be famous? And everybody raises their hand. Everybody runs up to me. Everybody wants to be famous. Okay, what are you willing to do to be famous? And here's where most people have a line in the sand they draw. You know, somebody will say, well, I would do anything to be famous, but nothing with kids or animals. Well, that's not who Satan wants. 
Satan wants the person that's willing to jump in the mud and be drugged through it. So I would leave that person, you know, and be like, I'm not interested. You know, and I'd turn around. They're like, but I can sing. I can dance. I can write great songs. It's like, yeah, but you're not willing to debase yourself or degrade yourself. So sorry. I'll take somebody else. So there was a guy there. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you his name, but he was in one of the most famous boy bands in the world. But he couldn't write a song. He couldn't sing. He couldn't dance. I mean, he was slightly overweight. He was willing to do anything. And I said, what about kids or animals? And he said, anything. So I handed him what's called a tier two card. It's a card and it has sometimes an address and a phone number and sometimes just a phone number. And I said, call that number and I'll see you in a few months on MTV. He apparently called the number because about three months later, he was on MTV and VH1. They go and make their deal. Once they make their deal, then it's up to the machine. You know, they're part of the machine and the machine moves them forward. They might have to dress a certain way. They might have to come out and say that they support some political figure. Chris Cornell and the guy from Lincoln Park were supposed to reveal to the world the details of the pedophile scandal within the rock and roll industry. And then just before they did it, they were both suicided out. Chris Cornell had just played a concert that night and had like his next six months of his life planned out what he was going to do. And then, and then he surprisingly killed himself. But both of them, that's, they both died at the same time of apparent yeah, they both suicide. Died at the same time. Some people believe that there's no afterlife. So, or everybody goes to heaven. If everybody goes to heaven, why did Jesus come? We didn't need Jesus if everybody goes to heaven. There's no need for salvation. How long were you a high wizard? 12 years. 21 to 33. But it's not like you were an atheist, is it? You weren't an atheist. You just, if you believed in there Satan, the devil, and a hell, then you must have believed in a God. He just wasn't as attractive to you. Well, you know, if you look at the different satanic covens that exist, like there's one called the Joy of Satan. And the Joy of Satan, they have a website and they have their own literature there. And they believe God is the bad guy and Satan is the good guy. And they have a lot of rhetoric that describes that. That was one of the earlier heresies in the in the church. Was, there were some who did believe that, well, we actually have two gods and they're kind of at war with each other and, you know, that kind of thing. So there's all kinds of heresies out there. How would uh, Satan nudge you? Or did you hear voices, see anything? Or was it a nudge or just you knew what to do when? I just knew what to do. Okay. Just before turning 15... I did my first assisted abortion. Um, You know, for the people that want to hear the more explicit version of that talk, if you go to allsaintsministry.org, I have a YouTube channel and I have some interviews on there that say explicit adult content. Okay. And it was legal. On your video, and I don't know if you want to go there right now, uh, the video of, I, I saw you giving a talk, and you mentioned what happened across a street from one of these occurrences. Is this a good time to go to that? Okay. Across the street is people walking around praying on Jesus ropes, Jesus chains, prayer beads, worry beads. I have no idea what they're called. We're standing upstairs. I'm dressed as the high wizard. And we're looking across the street because we hear these people chanting something. And upstairs, there's these giant jealousy windows. And the hand crank is right there. So I crank the window open. And we're listening to what they're saying. And I'm repeating it back. You know, I repeat what I hear. So it's Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And then my friend says, Holy Mary, Mother of God. 
And we burst out laughing. And we're like, who can be the mother of God? Well, that's an old woman. So I've got the surgical mask on and gloves, scalpel in my hand, but I don't really do anything with it. And we're waiting, you know, the, the doctor checks her and he says, um, you're not even dilated. Why are we here? And she said, the baby's in the birth canal. It's a late term abortion. Come on, get, get a move on. You know, this isn't my first rodeo. And he's like, you're not ready. And she, she's cussing us both out, calling us idiots. And when we're in the middle of that conversation, we hear a baby cry. At that point, a social worker and a nurse come in. They start filling out paperwork and taking care of the baby. And somebody adopts it. But the person that adopts it is a normal person. It's not a Satanist. And then when I got back to the office, I had them pull all of the files on every failed abortion by a high wizard. All the failed abortions happen during regular business hours at regular abortion clinics when there are people across the street praying on these Jesus ropes, Jesus chains, worry beads, prayer beads. But after reading all the reports, other than there's people across the street during regular business hours praying on these things, nobody said they were praying on rosaries. If everybody had said they were praying on rosaries, then that would have probably clicked and I'd have told my people, okay, we can't be out there during the day if there's people out there praying on rosaries because that apparently stops our abortions. Is that the only time you experienced that? I experienced three failed abortions. And all three had that same scenario. Amazing. So I had 100, 146 successful and three failures. And the rosaries involved in the failures. Yeah. Right. And that happened with all the high wizards wrote the same report. And we had a bunch of reports like that. You know, and I'm allowed to say no. I only turned down one spell in my entire life. You know, I believe that if you're paying millions of dollars to my coven, then you deserve to get what you're paying for. Am I supposed to ask which is the one you turned down? <laughs> well, if you want to ask, you don't have to ask. Well, I'm asking. Okay. I met with a group. I don't know who any of these guys were. They said they had paid my coven for a spell. And I'm sitting there, I'm pretty bored at this time, but I'm like, yeah, go ahead. What's, what's the spell? What do you want me to do? And they said they wanted a spell done so that they were basically a protection spell for them. They were going to, they were plotting to kill a future Pope. And they wanted it cleared so that nobody would be suspicious of anybody when it happened or that the truth, however they did it, would not be found out. And I listened to everything they said, and I said, no, I'm not your guy. And they said, are you Catholic? And I said, no, I'm a Satanist, like you. And uh, this guy said, I'm not a Satanist. And I said, well, I'm a Satanist. He said, no, I'm not killing the Pope. I didn't know anything about the Pope. Why were you drawing the line there? Why, why draw the line? I have no idea. It didn't even make sense to me when I did it. It didn't make sense it to you that you said, no, this, this is something I'm not going to do. Right. Interesting. You know, I, I had never turned down a spell, and suddenly I turned one down. How old were you then? How far were you into this then? Ten years? Yeah, I was probably about ten years in. Okay. So I equate my time to being as a high wizard to working in, like, a candy store. Like, it's a giant building filled with every type of candy, like candy from around the world is there sugar-free candy you know you have chocolates and um just sweets and jelly beans and bonbons and hard candy and soft shoes and fudge and just everything you can think of you know is in this one spot so that's all the sin you can possibly do is all this candy well after six months you've tried every piece you wanted to try and after a year, you've tried the pieces that you swore you'd never try. There are certain sins are disgusting, and you know you'll never do those. But after a while, you're committing every sin under the sun, 
and the ones you're used to committing are boring. So you try something new. After seven years, the store stinks. And imagine you had this job for 12 years. This job sucks. Yeah. There's no great high there's anymore. There's nothing new. There's nothing new. There's, 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 there's nothing fun anymore. It, you know, it's like you own the t-shirt factory that makes the t-shirt that says, been there, done that. You know, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. You know, there's, and then there's also, there's the fantasy and there's the reality. The fantasy is that I have a mansion in Calabasas, California, and I have an actual, an entire floor in Manhattan on a, in a high rise. And I have, um, a large condo in Atlanta. And I have one in vermont in in one of my bank accounts i have 38 million dollars in another bank account i have 12 million dollars you've got 50 million dollars it's your money or not your money it's not my money this is the illusion this is the fantasy i have armani suits that i wear um and then i have my high wizard costume and i have in one of my houses i have a garage with 12 cars one of them is a Lamborghini Diablo. All my cars are in the name of somebody in my satanic coven. All the mansions belong to somebody in the satanic coven. My millions of dollars is there for when I go buy a house and I go and I talk to the bank president and I tell him I've got rich man's problems. Rich man's problems are you have a 12 car garage that's kind of old. It's in the house I just bought, and I've got 13 cars. But the bottom line is you have access to all of this as long as you stay where you are as the high wizard. That is correct. But if you quit, it all goes away. I lose it all. Yeah. But the reality is I had an apartment that was very cheap. I lived in Tallahassee, Florida, and my car was a Nissan Sentra. And was that with the plan of someday, if I got to go, um, that this is the route I'm going out? Is there a plan to all that? Um, at the, when, when I first got in, no. You know, that was, you know, there's like the reality and the fantasy. The reality is that I lived in a cheap apartment and my favorite mode of dress would be like cutoffs and a rock and roll t-shirt. So, but you're thinking about walking away. It's all pretty boring now. You're thinking about it. Now, now that I've been in it for 10 years, uh, I'm really getting tired of what I'm doing. You, you can't own enough stuff. Nothing's big enough, grand enough, loud enough, sweet enough. Um, you know, at one time I was sleeping with a different girl every night. And that got boring after a while. Didn't even want to have sex anymore. You know, and at some point, if you stop sinning, they start getting concerned that you're, you're experiencing something, something's happening, you know, and they start trying to bring you sins, you know, trying to make you happy and make sure that you're, you know, not thinking about walking away, you know, and I kept saying, I can't walk away. Where would I go? You know, this is where I belong. This is what I do, you know, but. In the beginning, I got to travel. Now I have to travel. In the beginning, I got to meet with rock stars. Now I have to meet with rock stars. You know, I got to meet billionaires. Now I have to meet billionaires. You know, I got to practice magic. That's my favorite thing in the world. I'm like addicted to magic. But now I have to practice it. So I'm sad. You know, I've got guns in the house and I'm thinking about shooting myself. You know, I, but every time I think about dying, I think about, you know, selling my soul when I was 13 and I don't want to go to hell, you know? And at this point, I believe hell is real, but I'm not believing that when Satanists go there, that we'll be ruling the place. You know, it's like God created it as punishment. So punishment can't be pleasant. I've never liked it. So, you know, I, I'm just, I'm wondering how can I escape? I know that I can't steal their money and they would notice it filtering out. I mean, 
if I use their money for anything, I've got to account for it. So I start, and I know they're watching my money as well. So for about a year, I started filtering money out. You know, like I would take out like $50 and then I would buy groceries with it and do some stuff, but I would keep $10 for myself and put it in a sock drawer. You know, and every time I took money out, I would put some aside for myself. And any time I found money or if I did a spell for money, I would use some of it to buy some stuff, but I would store some of it away. So when I finally had a, a decent amount of change saved up, then I plotted my escape. And I made a doctor's appointment with a satanic doctor. And from my house, you had to get on the highway and drive a certain direction and then get off at the last exit for the town and then go to the doctor. So I did that, except instead of getting off at the last exit, I kept going. They watch you that closely. Um, I believe they did. I I was pretty paranoid. About yeah, that. it sounds like, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you kept going. I kept going. Zachary King is gone. He's driving away from all of it. He still loves doing magic, but he's leaving it all behind. And you heard all the despicable things, and there's more than that. But oh, And one of the things, by the way, is how he split up churches. Being the rich guy, he could go into, and he, he knew the Baptist church, so he would go into churches, and he'd be the rich guy. He'd be their savior. What do you guys need? I got all the money in the world here. Oh, my. And so they would trust him, and they'd be friends. And then he would just kind of quietly go around spreading little pieces of gossip that could split one person from another, and then ultimately the church itself, and pretty soon you've got a whole bunch of people leaving that church and starting up another church. So that was part of what he did, too. I think he said over 100 churches he split up that way. Yeah, just more the work of the devil. And off and off he went, right? Uh, he also talked about how you know, there's all this active work being done that you can kind of see that you, and you hear about. But there's also this passive work, this passive work of Satanism that's going on around all of us. And passive attack is they write papers or articles or write books or make CDs or movies, DVDs, um, have speakers traveling that do debates on atheism, communism, socialism, and New Age religions. And they have people creating New Age religions, not just writing about them, but, you know. Yeah, look at the work being done. You, did you guys get into colleges, too? Because that's sure is fertile territory. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, that's fertile ground. Those people are have their minds open and are willing to accept any kind of garbage you want to throw at them. Yeah. Almost the more ludicrous it sounds, the more readily they accept it. So Zachary King has left it all behind. He's out on the road, ends up in Vermont, finds little odd jobs, uh, ends up working retail. I was working for Piercing Pagoda, and one day this woman came in to buy a pair of gold earrings, and I sold her what I thought was like the perfect pair. At the end of the sale, I said, you know, I handed her the receipt, and I said, if you call the 800 number on the receipt, and take a survey, you might win $1,000. And she goes, that's fantastic. I've got something for you too. She pulls out this little gold disc, cheap gold colored piece of tin. You know, I sell gold and I sell cheap gold. I know this is cheap. And she says the strangest thing I've ever heard. She said, the blessed mother is calling you into her army. I, I don't have any idea who this is. I grew up Baptist. And then she said it's very powerful. Well, you know, there's between two and five high wizards in the world. And the number could be as low as one and as high as ten. But if there was only one, I would have been it. And there's seven billion people in the world. So I'm the top magic practitioner of the world. Wrap your brain around that. That's an ego trip and a half. So this thing isn't powerful. This has no mystique, no power, no challenge to this. This isn't going to touch me. This isn't going to do anything to me. So I figure I'm going to take it in my hand, and I'm either going to toss it on the floor or slam it on my counter and tell her that it's not powerful. And I stretch my hand out for it, and she's all pleased because I'm willing to take it. And she drops it in my hand, and I clench my fist around it, all ready to tell her these things. 
except when I wrap my fist around it, my mall and my store completely disappear. And I'm standing in this darkened void, and it's me and this woman that gave me the medal. Her name is Marianne Wickman. And she starts telling me about the magic spell I did the night before, and that's of the devil. And I committed over 100 abortions, and that's of the devil. And I split over 100 churches, and that's of the devil. And she tells me about nine or ten other sins that I've done that she couldn't possibly know and ends everything with, and that's of the devil. Let's go back to, I could have been the only one eye wizard out of seven billion people, top magic practitioner in the world. I could not have given you a worthless gold colored piece of tin and transport both of us to a dark and void and me know all your sins. Her magic is stronger than my magic and I was the eye wizard. So now I'm terrified of this woman. I, I don't know what to do. I Are you like seeing her? I mean, you said everything disappeared. Everything's gone black, but you're seeing that woman. I'm seeing that woman. And nothing else. And nothing else. And you've got, and you've got that gold medal in your hand. I've got this blessed, miraculous medal in my hand. Okay. And I don't know who this woman is. And, you know, I'm, I want to drop the medal. But what happens if I drop the metal and I fall through the dark and void? Magic can't get me back. I can't get back to my mall. You know, I can't get out of this place. You know, I might need this woman to get me back out because she got me in. You know, and what am I going to do? I don't know how I got here. I don't know where I am. I don't know who this woman is. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know anything. And I'm terrified. I'm sweating. And I, I don't want to, I'd like to attack her with magic, but if she can get me here, she's got the power to do anything to me. So I'm scared to attack her. I've never been scared to attack anyone. And she tells me again, the blessed mother is calling you into her army. And in an instant, I knew that was the mother of God. And I'm Baptist. We would never say mother of God. But in that instant, I knew it was the mother of God. And as soon as I realized that, Mary appeared to me. And she smiled at me. And it was a smile I knew I did not deserve. I was acutely aware of my 146 assisted abortions. And she took me by the hand, the same hand that held the medal. And she turned me around. And Divine Mercy Jesus was standing behind me. I didn't know what divine mercy was. I had these rays of light shining around me and over me and under me and through me. Yeah, it's a particular image of Jesus that came about from, uh, what, the 1930s? You're talking about uh, Faustina, St. Faustina? St. Faustina, right. Right, when, so, when he appeared to her. Okay. So, you know, I've got this happening, and in that instant, I realized I had not sold my soul to the devil, that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior, that all my magic, my occult, my Satanism, and my new age was false and fake. How was he looking at you? He looked at me was like pure love. He was like, it seemed like he was imploring me to accept him. And I realized everything Catholic was true. And the Blessed Mother told me that my job was to help her end abortion. And I opened my hand and I'm standing back in my store. I'm in my mall. This woman, Marianne Wickman, is telling me her name and where she goes to church. And she tells me that she is Father Joe Whalen's personal assistant and that he's the busiest priest in the world. She's the, he's the busiest priest he's ever met. He's the personal assistant, and she, he doesn't even have time to talk to her. And while she's talking to me, her cell phone rings. And she said, oh, this is Father Joe. I have to take it. And I was like, oh, yeah, you just explained all that. Go ahead. And at that time, Father Joe was starting to go deaf. So he talked like everybody was going deaf. And so everything he said on the phone, I could hear it. And she's like, hello, Father Joe. How can I help you? Can you hand the phone to the young man you're talking to? And she's like, certainly. So she hands me the phone. I'm shaking like Ozzy Osbourne. I'm like, hello? 
Welcome to the faith. Hand the phone back to Marianne. So I hand the phone back to Marianne, and I'm thinking, how the heck does he know me? How does he know this? And then we got two more phone calls likewise. And then her daughter came up to the counter, and she said, would you go get this man one of each of everything? So I didn't know what that meant. She came back with a paper grocery bag filled to the top with like 140 Lighthouse Catholic media discs. You know, and then full of pamphlets, why do Catholics do this or that? And I started going to daily mass the next day. Whoa. The next day? The next day. She gave me the address of where she went. So when I got home, I I walked in the door and my wife was doing the dishes and I said, Hey honey, guess what? I'm Catholic now. And she was like, of all the things you could be. And she agreed that she would go to the church with me. And the next day we went and at the consecration, now I don't know anything that's happening. This is different than the Baptist church. You know, at certain times people stand, sometimes they kneel, sometimes they sit. I'm like, well, this is different. And the stained glass windows look the same. And then at the consecration, I saw Jesus. And I was like, whoa, did you see that? She's like, what? I said, that man. She was, that's the priest. I said, no, the other guy. She was, I don't see another guy. But I thought everybody in the room saw the same thing. I thought everybody could see Jesus. Tell me what was going on. He's standing with the priest. Everything that the priest is doing, like if the priest has his hands up, then Jesus has his hands up. Whatever the motions that the priest is going through, Jesus is doing the same thing. And then he stands with the priest as the priest hands out communion. Which is what the faith says. He's standing in, in for Christ. Yeah. yeah. In persona Christi. There's that's the that's yeah, throw a little Latin into it there. There you go. <laughs> and you and you actually was, got to see it. I got to see it. I, I but I thought everybody was seeing this. Right. And then when, when that was going on, you know, I was telling Marianne Wickman was there every morning when I was going to Mass. And she told me that there was a place I could go where I could see Jesus anytime called Perpetual Adoration. And I said, is that like a sign-up sheet for that? Is there like a long line to get in or a long list? You know, do you have to sign up and then they call you when it's your time? She was like, no, you just go. You can go anytime. You know, and I mean, I was equating that to going to see a rock concert. You know, like I saw Pink Floyd four times. You know, and there's a huge line to get in. It takes hours to get out of the stadium because there's 90,000 people in the stadium. You know, everybody wants to see Pink Floyd. You know, so, you know, there, there's a line to get in to see Elvis, and he's been dead 40 years. We open the door to the chapel, and it's me and my wife and Jesus and this woman. This woman looks up like a deer in the headlights and packs as fast as she can go. And if this was an Olympic event, she got gold. And she said, you can't leave till somebody else comes in. And bam, she's out the door. And I thought, why would I leave? I'm in a room with God. So I started hanging out there anywhere from 30 minutes to 18 hours. And this was my favorite place in the world to go. Can we go back? Let's go back. I want to go back because um, when you had this experience where everything goes black and this Marianne Wickman suddenly, I, I take it she was kind of transformed and suddenly suddenly it's Mary instead of Marianne Wickman. Is that what it, or were they both standing there? How did that work out? No, they, they were both standing there. Both standing there. And here's Mary smiling at you, turns you around. You see Jesus loving you. Right. And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly you're then back where you were and you believed. Yeah. There was just no doubt in your mind that this wasn't some kind of weird acid trip or some kind of strange <laughs> occurrence or, you know, you, you were, conv you were convinced in that moment that whatever this was, was truth. It felt holy. It f how would you know what holy felt like? Because I've been immersed in evil my entire life. Felt the opposite of that. And then you were just all in. Did uh, girlfriend stay? Or did you scare her away with all this stuff? <laughs> she actually, she was my wife. And she, she had been brought up Jehovah's Witness. She researched the heck out of the Catholic Church. 
and researching them and getting into apologetics. And she fell in love with the church. I, you know, I always tell people on the podcast here that I'm Catholic, although the, the podcast technically is not Catholic, but I have no problem sharing things about what happens with rosary and miraculous medals and Eucharist and all mm-hmm. that. So it's just, it's part of what we do, but, but we have all faiths listening to this because, uh, <laughs> because, because Jesus is for everybody. And it's just, and it's, and, uh, the experiences people share on this podcast show us that he will meet us wherever we are as he met you, <laughs> as he met you in a very interesting place. There's no way this guy comes back from being this high wizard to, to this. There's just no way. When I was speaking at the NACOM in 2015, I think it was Father Calloway told me that a woman came to him and said, are you sure he's not a Satanist infiltrating the Catholic Church to lead us all astray? And he says, well, if he's still a Satanist, he's doing a lousy job. <laughs> so he goes, he goes to daily mass. He goes to confession regularly. He says to go every seven days. He only takes the Eucharist in a state of grace. When he's not in a state of grace, he won't take it. He tells all of us to always, you know, when Jesus comes back, you need to be caught being in the middle of a a novena. You need to to spend a lot of time in adoration. You know, he's like, pray a a daily rosary to have, you know, get devotions to certain saints and stick with them. He's like, why would a Satanist tell us to do all these things? What year was it that you had that experience, that turnaround moment? That was in January 2008. Had anything like it since? Well, obviously you've seen Jesus at Mass the next day. Uh, Since then, other experiences? On occasion. And when I first came in, I saw Jesus everywhere. I mean, every time that I went to adoration, I saw him. And every time I went to Mass, I would see him at the consecration. Or I would see him if he was in the tabernacle. What a life, buddy. How old are you now? Fifty-three. Mm-hmm. It does. Are you, are you not like the poster child for never give up hope when you pray for people? I don't know whose prayers are being answered. Somebody had some prayers going for you, buddy. I'm gonna. I give credit to my grandmother. She was Catholic and she prayed a rosary every day. I never knew what it was. What a merciful God we have. Incredibly. And now you are out evangelizing. This is what you do. Right. This is the job. What is your website again? Allsaintsministry.org. And I'm sure you have materials there, plus you're doing the speaking thing. And this is, is this your right. life now? Is this how you, know, you make your living? And is this it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. You know, I'd like to reiterate that if somebody listening thinks that you cannot go to God because you sold your soul, all you did was gave your will to the devil. You know, you go to confession, you've given your will back to God. You might need a deliverance or an exorcism, but, you know, all you've given given your will to somebody, so now you have to give your will to somebody else. Look at everything you did. How right. ma- how, maybe I should go to you and just say, how how long did you have to battle everything you would have been involved in and that God had forgiven you. When I came into the church, I did a life confession where I confessed everything I did as a Satanist. So I had to do that before I could receive communion. How many hours, days, whatever it was. <laughs> any final, uh, Any final words here or there, Zach? There is no sin you can commit that's so big it can't be forgiven. Thank you, Zachary King. There is no sin that can't be forgiven. People have asked him, were you possessed? Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll admit he was possessed. Did he have an exorcism? Not in the traditional way. When Jesus and Mary showed up, there was an exorcism like that. He was on the good guy side. Priests have commented how if you're possessed... The thought of sitting in there for 18 hours, up to 18 hours in Eucharistic adoration, uh-uh. The two don't, they don't go together. But St. Augustine got something right. He got a lot of things right, but 
He is maybe most quoted for saying that my heart is restless until it rests in you, Lord. Zach got restless, not for the Lord. He doesn't know what he's restless for. All he knows is he has everything and he's restless. It's a great story of conversion. What did, what did Jesus tell us? When you try to save your life, you lose it. You know, when, when, when your life, me, 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 is all that you have, when you try to save your life, you lose it. You, you risk eternity. But when you give up your life for Jesus, for those around us, when you love, that's when you, <laughs> that's when you save your life and you have eternal life with Christ. Zach doesn't know any of that at the moment and for all those years, you know. Something else that, that really struck me with Zach's story as well is, is God's mercy how for all of us, especially as we're finding our bodies, if you will, and hey, that feels good, and that tastes good, and ooh, that feels, you know, everything, and then to, to the, the, our mind, how is our mind supposed to keep up with our bodies when we're told those who try to save their lives lose it, those who give up their lives have eternal life? There's no way. Come on, my, at least mine. I'll just talk about my mind. My mind certainly wasn't there. What do you mean it's not about me? What do you mean life isn't about me? It's all about me at that age. I, it's all so new and exciting, and there's just no way. And so God gives us time to figure it out and work our way back. Such mercy. And, and to go get that one, leaving the 99, I think there's sure a lot of ones. I don't know how many 99s there are, but there's sure a lot of us ones that Jesus came after, thankfully. Also in this episode, we just see how much the devil hates us. Why? Because he used to have this. He used to have that heavenly realm. A third of the angels fell. They used to feel this love. They used to be a part of that communion of love, of heaven. And then they decided, no, I'm God. And they betrayed our God. And if they can't have it, they don't want us to have it. They will do everything to keep us from it. Everything, including telling you, oh, yeah, yo, 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 there's no problem going to hell. You'll run the joint. Really? Please. But ultimately, Zach didn't really believe that. Has he had death threats since leaving it all behind? Yeah. Interesting. All the experiences that black magic brought him for all those years, all those experiences, and he had one encounter with Jesus and Mary, a real doozy, one encounter, and it was over. That's the power of our God. His website, again, is allsaintsministry.org if you want to find out more. You have a story? Go to touchbyheaven.net. Love to hear from you. My Patreon shout out this week goes to Carrie Pastoric. Thanks, Carrie, for helping us out on a monthly basis through Patreon. Uh, if you feel blessed by these episodes, if they lift you, inspire you, uh, and if you'd be so kind to help us out on a monthly basis, you, you make this all go. People ask, do you need Patreon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. So if you can help us out, we thank you so much. You can either come here to episode 125 of, of touchbyheaven.net and click through on the link. Or go to patreon.com and uh, just search for Tramper Jack. And thank you for that support. Uh, also, while you're here at episode 125, um, click on the keep it, it stay informed, keep it, stay informed. Uh, just click on the stay informed link because that way we can send you a weekly email about other Touched by Heaven stories. In the Touched by Heaven universe, uh, we send out an, a weekly email as well, okay? And uh, thanks for the ratings and reviews. You're keeping us a five star podcast. Appreciate that so much. How about we do this again next week? Shall we? We shall. Okay. Here at Touched by Heaven, everyday encounters with God. See you next week. I'm Trapper Jack.